like having a member of the royal family in here today, you know, with your photographers, but you're being greeted by everyone every two it's like seconds. It's like a late, late show here, honestly. It's a joke, like, live audience. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Luke McGrath felt quite as loved last night when you came an hour and a half late, sweating buckets, was and it was just the two me, of us. He was there with me. So uh, you need to get over that, seriously now, honestly. We've had enough Gav is over us. We've already discussed it. He's moved on. Move on. We're done. We're done with that now. Are you late? A lot. Not regularly, no. Well, I'm it shows how important today was, Paul. He was 10 minutes early, I say, for the first time oh, ever. I'm honoured. I'm yeah, honoured. So I'm honoured. It shows how big a deal it is today, Paul. Well, we're delighted to have you in. And it's interesting. I was doing a bit of research there. On this day 10 years ago, Paul, yourself and Luke would have been preparing to fly to Rome for your second Six Nations game of the Grand Slam campaign, having just beaten France. It's funny, you've both been on the road together for, you know, for a good while yourselves, and it shows how much rugby has evolved in Ireland now and since that time. Like, when I put you back to that time, like, what comes to your mind initially? Uh, back to the year we won the Grand yeah. Slam. Um, we had a massive night out after that uh, Italy game, actually. <laughs> Do you remember Raj kicking my shins for, for a few hours? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and that wouldn't happen now, probably, would it? Probably less so. I don't know. It's um, tricky. It's hard to say, would it? Yeah, now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose Eddie had just finished with Nilo um, in, I suppose, when was it? Just after the Six Nations in 2008. We hadn't played well for a while. Um, and Declan Kidney had taken over with uh, Kurt Small and and Les had come in then, hadn't he? Um, so we probably played a kind of a simpler game. I, you know, I always remember, you know, Brian O'Driscoll scored a good few tries in the campaign, all from about two <laughs> yards. <laughs> Uh, it should have been your tries, <laughs> taking, taking your yards. <laughs> they were, uh, and uh, I, I remember, it was the year when you could put as many you could put as many people into the line out as you liked. Uh, so if the other team had, I think if the other team had had seven in the line out, you could put eight, and we we defended with eight in the line out a lot, and we did a bit of a job on teams line outs quite a bit, and uh, we won that first game against France um, at home. We hadn't beaten France in a long time. We won that first game against France. Jamie scored that really good try. Um, Brian scored a great one that day as well. His only one from yeah. the outside two yards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really good try. Yeah, and uh, you had a nice and once to we Jamie won that as well, game, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and once we, I think I remember now. I came off a four-man line out uh, and a line break down the left. But uh, and once we won that game, we had momentum. Um, England weren't. We're going through a, a tough period. They weren't as strong as they are now. Um, yeah, so when, once we won that French game, we had momentum and uh, it ended up being a great year. And Luke, for yourself, it would have been, I guess, one of your first times, you know, being in with Paul O'Connor in the, around the Irish camp. Like, what were your first impressions of Paul when you started playing with him? Because I guess you would have played with, you know, Brian O'Driscoll, some of these other big guys at Leinster, but to come in with Paul, what was that like? Uh, yeah, well, I've been there for three years, Will. Um, so I knew him well enough at that stage. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, we were obviously, you know, like you would have looked at Paul and obviously the 06, I was just out of school uh, and 08 with Munster and obviously he was a big leader and talisman there and, you know, played the same role um, in, in the Irish team. So yeah, very exciting times. And I came in at a great period in the team where, well, obviously I got the end of, of uh, Eddie O'Sullivan's era, that, that match in Twickenham where we were stuck outside for two hours looking at the stadium. Um, and that was the last game for, for poor old Eddie in that one. But uh, came in in a period where there was a lot of change, a lot of really good coaches. Uh, Paul mentioned there, a lovely Afrikaans accent for Gert Small. I was going to say, I noticed that, very nice. Oh, see, it's not Gert. He used to get a bit insulted if you call him <laughs> There you Gert. go. Wouldn't <laughs> want to insert that man. But uh, Les Kiss was a guy you mentioned as well at the end who had a massive impact. And he's pretty much, you know, like he changed defence really, especially in an Irish context. And lots of people, I think it's, it's, it was the envy of lots of other teams when you think of you know, that choke tackle that everyone kind of employs now in Ireland, obviously still do it particularly well. So it was a great period to come in, Will. Um, lots of great players, you know, guys like uh, Brian O'Driscoll obviously playing in the team, uh, Ronan O'Gara, of course. So, like, it was, a, it was a very talented bunch, so I felt very lucky, really. It's funny, Paul, you mentioned how, like, you know, you would have gone on a big night out after the game in Rome and how the lineup was a lot different and Luke was saying how the choke tackle was brought in. Like, rugby's changed so much since then. It feels like that was kind of the start of way, where the journey we're on, where we are at the Irish team at the moment, almost. I don't know if it was the start, really. I mean, every group now, it seems to be better than the last, you know. And uh, I mean, I think 99, 2000, that, that Munster team, you know, obviously a Munster bias, but that Munster team was probably the the real big start of it for me. I mean, they created, by the time I came into Munster in 2001, um, 
you know, I kind of expected to win and I was going to be part of a Heineken Cup winning team any year. Whereas if you played for Munster three years before that, they were getting beaten by 60 points in Toulouse. So some of the guys that played in that team never got to win a European Cup medal for Munster, but they actually did something a lot harder in that they they changed the culture or they, they flicked the switch and, and created something. I mean, I remember going to watch Donegal Callaghan play for Munster in Gary Owen. It was about f- against Ulster in an Interpro game. It was about 400 people at it, you know. Um, nowadays, we have massive crowds at the game. So that group really flicked the switch. Gatland around then as well. Started with the Irish team. He, that test against Scotland where he brought in the five first caps. Um and it's been on an upward curve ever since. And it's been, uh, I think, slow and steady at times, but it's been pretty meteor- meteoric at times as well. And I think even uh, the more I'm involved in rugby now, the more I look back at some of the things that happen. It, you know, Eddie O'Sullivan never won a championship or never won a Grand Slam, but he did incredible things for, for, <coughs> for us in terms of changing habits and professionalism. I remember we had to... Mervyn Murphy was his video analyst, who's still with the Irish team. It was incredible what he did, but there was a period there where we had to sign in and sign out <laughs> of when we had done our analysis, you know. And you couldn't do that with professional rugby players now. They'd throw their toys out of the pram and, you know, they'd be, it, it'd be, it's something you couldn't do. But back then, you kind of you, you kind of had to do it. You needed a bit of a, a headmaster um attitude to get us to do it but once we started doing it we totally bought into it and by the time me and Luke were on the lines in 2009 it was all the Irish players were on the analysis laptops o- over um, in South Africa o- the Irish players for a long time now have had very very good habits um, and a lot of it goes back to those years and some of the development that the IRFU put in around the academies coaches like Eddie O'Sullivan, Declan Kidney <laughs> You know, making great calls like bringing in the likes of Michael Checker, bringing in great players like John Langford and Asiwa, um, and and uh, I can't remember the question now. But I, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, yeah, you just <laughs> said that that, that was the start. Yeah. Of, yeah. That was the start of it. But it wasn't really. There's there's been an awful lot of people that have um, I think made long term decisions and and probably invested in players and invested in coaching and it's really benefited in the long term. I mean, even the type of coaching that Joe Schmidt does now, um, you know, I think Irish players were probably, are probably, were probably the country that was one of, probably capable of, of taking it on and doing it the most because we had such great habits around analysis, around learning your role. Um, it was a big part of, of, of what we did and not a lot of other countries do that. You know, I mean, every Irish player would have a copy book in the meeting, would be taking notes and that's been happening for a long time. It's not common practice everywhere else. Um, yeah, like know. in your own coaching career now, you're obviously over in Stadford and say, you know, a big club in France. Does it give you a new appreciation for the stuff you've just touched on now and how, I guess, how well the Irish players have it or how dedicated they are to that side of the game? <clears throat> yeah, I think it would give you an appreciation for... I think the long-term investment maybe that happens in academies or under-20s coaching where where they get players to, you know, I think when you're, when you're into a professional setup or the Irish setup, you can, tell, you can tell a player to do something and they know how to do it very, very quickly. You, you don't need a lot of it. explanation. You can show in footage that another team are doing, I want to have a look at this or try this. You can do it straight away. When you're very young and you haven't got the tactical appreciation yet, you need to learn a, a lot of things. So you need to present, you need to help players present player. You know, you need to give them little projects, groups of five to go away and look at these and come back and present to the players. And then you question them. And uh, that was my experience with the under 20 team last year, that a lot of the things we assume, we assume from Irish players. Now, a lot of that work is done by other coaches at lower levels. Uh, and, and as I said, a lot of the things we did with Eddie, I mean, I remember one s- summer doing switches and loops. I'd say you weren't there yet, Luke. I think it might have been before the World Cup in 2003. We spent half a summer learning how to do a proper switch and a proper loop play. And, <laughs> you know, I think... Seems l- quaint now. <laughs> yeah, but I think a lot of maybe coaches further down the line benefited from it. Mm. And it's only when you get a bit older and you look back at a lot of the things and you look back... 
at some things that seems to come so naturally to an Irish player now that maybe doesn't to another player. You you see the combination of other people that have 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 done so much work behind the scenes as well and probably invested for the long term and maybe not gotten the benefit of it in their own coaching career. Yeah, look, it's an interesting one and you've obviously moved into that space now. I mean, how have you found, when you talk about those habits kind of being ingrained at a, at a young age and kind of almost an expectation that an Irish player would be, you know, having a copybook in a meeting, be, easy, you know, very, very coachable, have good habits from an early age. How have you found that transition in France? We, we had a good conversation with Bernard Jackman about some of the challenges there. Bang, Bang desserts, don't do that. Yeah. Call. You might last much longer. <laughs> because your job, well, you obviously would have known through Mike Prendergast, of course, of course, would have been coaching in Grenoble with, with Bernard Jackman. But it was interesting to get his take on some of the challenges there. Like, have you found it? What, what are the challenges you found so far over in France? Well, there's, there's, they've, a load of, they've a load of challenges. To me, the, the f- people talk about the French culture and uh, like they won the Soccer World Cup playing really disciplined uh, mm. football. So, you know they can do they can do it the exact same as any other country provided the the conditions are right but i think you know one of the things for me is that we have four provinces here it's a nice small pool it's it's run by the union um the the, the international coaches get to see the players an awful lot the international coaches get to influence an awful lot of what goes on in the the clubs and the provinces um you know the national set up invest in lots of different things like uh you know nutritionists for the provinces Munster have i think a, a part-time nutritionist with the academy and a, a full-time nutritionist with the with the senior set up and then there's a nutritionist with the Irish team you know we don't have a nutritionist in in Stade Francais for the players and you don't you guys you don't have a nutritionist no for no no we, we we don't and and it's because there's a massive. I think there's a big battle for wages in France, and and there probably there's probably money there for wages for the players, and maybe other things get cut a little bit. A lot of the things we assume are normal in Ireland, like uh, you know the amount of analysis laptops that might be available for players, or the amount of physios, um, um, or or as I say, the availability of a nutritionist. So. That's one of the things I think that 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 probably that probably holds them back a bit. I think is that not something you'd come in from your back and be like, what what the hell's going on in here, guys? Well, it's not a case of what the hell is what's <laughs> going on. I mean, it, I mean, if you can't if you can't afford a if the if, if the club can't afford something, they can't afford something. It's the way it is. And uh, but if you're playing like, players, Paulie, like for and, and the wages are you know. You know they're strong over in France to call. It's probably to now. I'm sure there's probably maybe ten or fifteen who are very strong, and they might be you know might tail off then at that point. But if that tails off, I mean, is it not an easy enough conversation to have with someone saying, "Well, look, you know, we've thirty five guys in the squad here. There is nearly every single one of them body fat. Let's call it maybe thirty out of thirty five is body fats. You know, over ten percent what it should be for a professional athlete. Do you not say, well? That's going to have a big effect on us in the last 10 minutes of a game. Should we not say, let's maybe have one more medium, like medium salaried guy and have two other guys or girls as, you know, in there as a nutritionist to maybe say we'll get far bigger benefit for that stuff. Is that not an easy uh, enough it's, conversation? It's, it's, it's not as simple as that. I mean, um, it's not as simple as that. At the moment, we have a lot of injuries. So we're, we're down to uh, three props at the moment in the club that are available for selection this weekend. We're scouring... Uh, we're scouring the world looking for a prop and uh, with the salary cap it, you know there's a certain salary cap there so so now once we bring in another prop we're in danger of the salary cap and we're approaching the top of the salary cap so that's not a target <laughs> you, you, it's not a target but it's just it's just the way it is there's mm. you know there's yeah there's other clubs there that, that that pay an awful lot of money and and just players they, they, they go where 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 the money is, and uh, and ultimately, you know, probably the first thing you do is you try and assemble the best squad you can you can get your hands on. That's the first thing, and and yeah. everything is in addition to. It. I understand what what you're saying, it, but it's rarely just as simple as, you know. And and in fairness, our guys are pretty good, uh, body fat wise. Uh, they train really really hard. They work incredibly hard. That that's just one example I, I give you. But I think. One of the things as well is that I think an Irish rugby player is the exact same as a French rugby player, but just the outside influences in coaching that have made a massive difference here 
haven't taken effect in, in, in France. So you can go all the way back to Warren Gatland, you can go all the way back to John Langford coming into Munster and the effect he had right up through Alan Gaffney in, in Leinster and then in Munster, Matt Williams in Leinster, Rob Penny in Munster, Michael Checker, what a, what a difference he made. You know, some of the S&C coaches from abroad that have come in, uh, you know, Stuart Lancaster, Andy Farrell, mm. Joe Schmidt, they don't have the same effect in France as they do here because of the language. And that is a, a, a massive difference. And they don't have the same effect on the players, but they don't have the same effect on other coaches around them. And there's plenty of people around now. Um, there's plenty of coaches around now in Ireland, and you, you can see they have little Joe Schmidt uh, isms, deep kind of, isms yeah, in yeah, their yeah, coaching yeah. Or, or Stuart Lan you know Stuart Lancaster does loads of these open training sessions where he's mic'd up so loads of Leinster schools have little Stuart Lancaster isms and you know I'd, I'd have little bits of Joe and Andy Farrell stuff in what I do and Simon Easterby so that's a I think that's probably you know England Eddie Jones uh, Scotland Vern Cotter Wales Warren Gatlin Sh um, Sean Edwards that's a big, big thing in France that a lot of the, a lot of the top class coaching that we've managed to harness, Razzy Erasmus, uh, Jacques Niedebar, that we've managed to pull in and, and use and learn and copy Bernard hasn't Jackman. taken effect in, in Bernard Jackman France. did the exact same thing, Paul. It was kind of about a cross pollination of ideas, kind of, that yeah. you don't really get access to that because he was talking, remember he said he was on a... It's almost too obvious an explanation, but it's like he's staring you right in the face. It like kind of does. They don't speak the same language, therefore it's hard to get your message across. Yeah, yeah. and like, I mean, I, 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 I speak to, to the players in, in Stade Francais and, and if, you know, if they speak really good English, I can really explain myself really well. Uh, if they don't speak great English, and I certainly don't speak great French yet, but... We struggle to to get the message, and sometimes you have to bring a laptop down into the gym, and you have to bring someone in that speaks good English, and you have to, and everything takes a little bit longer. So, you know, th I think Joe Joe was a teacher. I think he was an English teacher as well, was he? Mm. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, you you know, when you're in one of his meetings, how clear he explains oh, things, yeah. how how he creates a story and makes you know, makes all the little things he wants us to do really interesting. And uh, it's, diff you know, it's a difficult thing to do when you speak English, you know, uh, when, you're sp when you speak English and you're speaking to English people, not to mention, not to mention when you speak in another language, you know, so. One thing I'd be interested to get your opinion on, like some, a lot of the top rugby coaches didn't have huge playing careers themselves. They didn't go from being a top international straight into coaching. And sometimes people say, well, is it because it's very hard for a top player to maybe understand why other players aren't able to deliver to their standards that they hit as players or to, to dedicate themselves the same way. Like, is any of that making sense to you as I say it? Like, is there any times you struggle with maybe players not hitting the, the, the dedication levels you might have had in your career or, or the levels of performance you had? Uh, I, I think you definitely assume, I, I definitely would assume too much. Um, now, that would probably come more to the is more down to the last few years I had where 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 you know we worked under under Joe Schmidt in Ireland and we reached a really high level of, of, of detail and understanding. And you guys as well then like Jason Cowman, the S and C coach with Ireland, who was incredible. Um Greg Feek, the scrum coach, Simon Easterby, uh Les Kiss, you know, real high detail coach. So sometimes I think I definitely assume too much. I think a lot of coaches that maybe don't have big names that tend to be end up being very good coaches are teachers. So Joe Schmidt, uh, Graham Henry, Stuart Lancaster. And that's the thing I find that I'm missing the most, most is a, a teaching qualification and, and teaching experience. Because uh, I think any player, any, any guy could go and be a video analyst with Munster or Leinster or, or whatever it is now, and they could learn the game inside out. They could learn as much or maybe even more than than some players because I mean I'm a second row and I know a lot about second row forward play and, and maybe front row play and back row play but backfield cover maybe not so much but a video analyst will have a little bit on everything um, but then it's a question of, of whether you can transfer that knowledge or transfer I suppose the ability of people you, you can transfer the knowledge or, or or give people a, a way to change their habits to be better at something. And I think teachers have that and they've started 
at a very young age. They've, they've a teaching qualification. They've started in a very young age in school where they have eight classes a day or whatever it is. You know, you you try you try what you're trying to do for forty minutes, and you you reflect and you go in again and try something. And I think teachers definitely probably more than the guy that's played professional rugby at the very top level have have a have a have a big advantage. I think and. Uh, I think those guys make very good coaches. And is that? Do you think that's your biggest challenge as a coach? Is because I, I would, when I think of you as a player, I always think great understanding, really uh, like able to deliver a message very, very succinctly and well, and, and have impact. Um, you know, like most really good or great leaders have. But it's interesting here. It sounds to me like that sounds like it's your biggest challenge. Is it? Well, see, when you're playing, you can you can like if we if I when you when you call the line out, you you maybe coach it a little bit as well. When you're when you're the line out caller, you you, mm -hmm. you want people to do things a certain way, and you've maybe painted a picture in your head of how the line out is going to work, so it has to happen like this. But you're standing in the middle of it with them, and you're doing it with them, and you're saying. Whereas when you're coach, you're standing on the outside, and you're. Do you ever get in? Uh, <laughs> I get in a demo all the time yeah. because of the language and because mm. some p people learn in different ways. But that is the main challenge. I mean, as a player, I say, no, no, do it this way, exactly this way. And uh, I think as a coach, you have to maybe let them find their own way a little bit. But sometimes you have to tell them you have to do it this way as well. And that's the, that's the biggest challenge for me. And I, I think as a player, I would have been, no, listen. I'm, I'm, if I call this on Saturday, this is exactly how I want you to do it. Um, so, so that is that's another that's another challenge. I think as a player, you we could be very very and and because we're gonna, you know, if I, if you if you, you know, we were quite tough on each other because we were so tight. I think we were quite tough on each other, but it, it's easy to be tough on a guy at training. Because afterwards you're probably going to be sitting with him at dinner. You might be going to the cinema with him. You might be going to have a coffee with him. He knows. He knows it's not personal. Whereas <laughs> as a coach, you know, you mm. if you get stuck into a guy, you probably head up to your office that evening. You don't see him for the rest of the day, um, and uh, and he, maybe he doesn't have that assurance. So I, I think as as a coach, I'm probably not as strict as I was maybe as a player. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not sitting there with the lads and uh, like I always there's a funny one in campus when Joe kind of would, every now and then would sit in with the guys and, and you know having dinner and the lads used to always have a bet about how long could you keep him talking before he starts on about rugby? I was I always wonder like so you're not in that situation are you? I, I don't think so no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, you're in the Roy Keane school you got to uh, sit apart. I think uh, yeah I, I, yeah I think we're apart a little bit but mm -hmm. I think rugby is probably mostly where I end up chatting about as well. Um, and I think a lot of them want to talk about rugby. They want to know... A lot, of the, a lot of the French players, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of the French players have, have mm. grown up at a time where France always beat Ireland. And they're now at a time where Ireland seems to be on top of France, not just with the national team, but with the, the club teams as well. And they see we've only four clubs they see we don't have the athletes they have so they, they, a lot of them like talking about Irish rugby and Munster rugby and Leinster rugby Ulster Connacht they, they enjoy shooting the breeze about it move on to I guess current affairs and rugby in just a second but one last thing on your coaching career I, I read a very interesting interview you did with Keane Tracy of the Irish Independent a few months ago and uh, friend of the pod friend of the pod actually Tracy. sitting in studio he, he just loves the pod so much he's just sitting in observing uh, but he asked you about obviously a lot of Munster fans always like to talk about maybe if you were come back and coach there one day but you you were quite reluctant you said you just talked about the scrutiny that if you were in charge there and I guess it's a very tough place to coach like is there a worry that you, you would you be worried about your legacy there and that you're so popular there that if you went back and it didn't go well, how quickly things well, can turn? I, I wouldn't be worried about my legacy at all. I, I'd be just, I, I really enjoy going to Munster games. I enjoy what I had with Munster and what I have with Munster. Um, uh, so I think you have to be very, very sure of yourself if you were ever to do that job or take that job. I think pe different people are different. You know, Felix Jones went straight into it, loved it. Um, is brilliant at what he does. Jerry Flannery wasn't far off doing the same. I think different people are, are, are different. I mean, I, I I nearly ended up in Toulon when I finished my career because I wanted to live in France. I wanted to learn the language. And this opportunity to go to Paris came up kind of out of nowhere mid-summer. And, uh, and we decided to do it for the same reasons. We wanted to live in France. Uh, I wanted to learn the language. And 
I wanted to find out a little bit more about coaching, if it's the right thing for me or not. So um, I'm lucky that I've had those opportunities. The same with the Irish 20s and a little bit of work with the Munster Academy. I'm lucky I've been able to dip in and out uh, on a few occasions, and, and this is no different. When you say sure of yourself, does that mean sure of that you want to be a full-time coach or sure of what your idea would be with Munster if you were to get that job, or, or what do you mean exactly? Uh, I think, like, uh, you never have all the answers. Even if you look at Ireland, uh, even if you look at Ireland last week against or two weeks ago against England, I mean, Joe's probably the, considered the best coach in the world, but they, they'd say they were a little bit undercooked going into that game against England, and they, they got a few things wrong. You know, if that can happen to someone at his level with his experience and his foresight, you know, you can imagine what happens, what can happen when you don't have that experience and that foresight. So I think if you do want to take a job as big as that, or if I did, you'd want to have plenty of experience and you'd want to really, you'd really want to know it's what you want to do because I'd say there's going to be, there'd be plenty of tough days where you question what are you doing, you know, and, 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 when you do question it, you need to know you're doing it for the right reasons and you, and you want it 100%. And would you have talked to, you see, it was interesting here you saying you were, you know, you wanted to move to France to get a bit of, you know, it sounds like it was a bit of a cultural thing as well, you know, move the family yeah. over, everyone's speaking a bit of French. Would you have talked to, you know, Mike Prendergast or would you have talked to, you know, Raj before you went yeah. over to get well, a bit of a sense of things? I, I spoke to Mike Prendergast most weeks anyway since I've, since I've been... 18 or 19 years of age um, and same with Raj you know I obviously played with him for most of my career and then when he left for France I would have spoke to him you know every two weeks or a week or three weeks or whatever it is on and off so um, um, but uh, I, you know they, they both would have said listen it's well worth doing and there's all sorts of challenges but I think it's the same with Toulon I think there would have been plenty of people would have told me not to go to Toulon, would have said there's plenty of other places in France that I think would be better experiences. And uh, they might have been right, but I ultimately wanted to find out myself. And it was the same with this. Uh, what sales pitch did Bujalal give you? I heard he's a bit of a character. He didn't give me any sales pitch, actually, because it was... It was really Paul Stridgen who was the strength, <laughs> who was the strength and conditioning coach. This guy coach. Is, is the best character, wasn't that, he? That's, was that's, that almost <laughs> signed me. So he, he just he spoke to Tom Whitford, who would have been the manager of the club, and, and suggested that I'd be a good fit. So it was Tom Tom really that signed me, I think. you know, And, and I spoke to Tom and Paul Stridgen um, a lot more than I did to, to, to Murad or, or to anyone else in the club before I signed. And just, I guess, moving on to now the Irish team in 2019, such a big year. And although we're in the middle of a Six Nations, I think Joe, after the first two weeks, has already said we have a big thing at the end of the year that they're kind of focusing on. It's all about maybe finally getting to a semi-final and beyond this year. Like, if you were, say, still in the camp, what would your messages be at the moment now looking ahead to 2019, having been through what you've been through with the other World Cups? What would you try to be saying to the players or to the squad to get ready for that big challenge? They, I wouldn't be saying a lot. I think uh, the big strength of the Irish team is they don't look too far ahead. I'm sure the coaching staff, you know, are, are constantly looking ahead and constantly planning ahead. Um but they they don't they don't put that on the players or they don't they don't encourage that in the players. They're very much and I know it's like it's a big cliche, but it is something they've managed to build as a habit in the players. They're very much focused on what's coming next. Um so as a player, you know, in the back of your mind, it, you, you need to be in the best shape of your life. You, you know, you need you know you need to be delivering on the things that are really important to the Irish game plan if you want to get picked for the World Cup. But um, in camp, ro there'll be no mention of, of the Rugby World Cup. Um, Even as Joe was saying in players. the press after the game that, that it is the focus. Uh, I, I don't know if he said it is the focus. I think he might have said that the, the, the injuries that have happened at the moment are are providing them with an opportunity to, I think he said, vaccinate themselves from w one of the problems they had at the last World Cup is where they, where we had a lot of injuries and maybe struggled a little bit because maybe the guys didn't have the experience or the match fitness, not that the quality of player wasn't there. Um, and I think that goes all the way back. I think when we won the first test in South Africa in 2016, I think we made five changes as well for the second test. You know, we know we haven't won a test series ever in South Africa and won a test series down under since 
1979 in Australia, I think. It was days on that? It wasn't, no. no. <laughs> He's not that old boy. Really <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but he still made five changes. Now, we, we mm. didn't win the test series, but I think there's been a very, very strong squad been developing over time, and the injuries aren't ideal that's happened to us at the moment, but they're, they're, the pain we're experiencing is probably great for, for what's going to happen at the Rugby World Cup. I don't think... I don't think I don't think we're making changes with the Rugby World Cup in mind. Do you think though, like when we because I when I think back on that match, like if you took like they were five top top players that came out of the Irish team. Like I feel like you know I, I agree with sorry developing around getting as many people to expose as possible to help insulate you from an incident like that. But I still feel like that was a real once off. Like if you took five of New Zealand's top players, I'm not going to go through them now, but it's always the example I give. I give. Think of their top five players, and you're going to say someone told me that that wasn't going to affect their performance. Um, by bringing in other guys, like there were five really top guys that that, that were out of the team for that yeah. match. You know. I'm not sure we're as ill-suited or as ill-prepared at that point as we were. I just think we got really unlucky. Yeah, we, we definitely got unlucky, but, you know, wh why not? Why not prepare? Agreed. Why not prepare Agreed, for yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and, and why not prepare for, you know, why not prepare for it in a way that doesn't affect how we play as well? I mean, I mean, like, I think Wales probably took a little bit of a risk against Italy with the amount of changes w they made. Um, and I know Ireland have, have made, we've probably been lucky with some of the changes we made, like uh, Kieran Marmion, I think, started against New Zealand, and oh. um, Joey coming on the other day against Scotland. Um, uh, you know, I think when you look at New Zealand, they have whatever, five super rugby teams, but they've also another pretty professional league down underneath that in the, the Mitre 10, so oh. they have an awful lot of players coming through, whereas... Whereas we probably don't, and uh, we have guys that are really susceptible to coaching. So th I think the more you can get them into that Irish setup and get them, like look at Quinn Rue at the weekend to come in and you know calling a hundred percent, winning a hundred percent of your line out these days is a very difficult thing to do. Um, to do it when you've just come in out of nowhere, um, it's a it's a real sign of the strength and depth of the squad. So. I think it can only be a good thing for the Irish team he heading to the World Cup, and the, I think there's a less of a gap between one and two than the, than there than there ever used to be in Irish rugby now. And what do you think Joe should do going forward the rest of the Six Nations? Obviously, Johnny Saxon took that heavy knock against Scotland. Would you keep him out of the next couple of games? Would you play him? Would you play Joey Carberry? Like, there's a lot of little different t subplots kind of that Joe has to weigh up in his head. Does he play his best team now? Does he does he kind of try to vaccinate the squad further? I don't know. I think uh, I think <laughs> the vaccinate. Yeah, probably I think shouldn't give two vaccinations <laughs> to a patient. To be fair, <laughs> I think that uh, Joe speaks a lot about you know giving one hundred percent to what's right in front of us. So I, I can't see him making changes that are. I think Johnny is probably our first choice out half, not by. Not by miles, but he, he certainly is out there on his own. And I think if you start rotating the squad in a Six Nations, maybe you aren't you aren't leading by the example or or, 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 or delivering what he wants from the players. I, I, I when when um when Finney and Mitchell banged into Johnny that time and he and he got a bang in his knee and I, I thought he was gonna be out for the first two games. I thought he was that Johnny was gonna be out for the for the Scotland game and the England game, I thought the stars were aligning a bit because if I felt that Joey Carberry was, you know, he's going to get two really, really big high-pressure yeah, games yeah, yeah. where <clears throat> he's in for Monday and he gets to run the show because the way Johnny and the way Johnny and maybe Ron Agarra before thing, before him uh, has done things, the out half is a real kind of coach, uh, almost a captain, a leader in the team, and. And from Monday's training on, they really are running the show. And oh. uh, I thought it would have been great for Joey Carberry to get that opportunity because, you know, we've we've seen it in other places now where uh, Marmion has played some big games, Luke McGrath has played some big games. Um, and probably nearly every other position, we have guys that can jump in and out. We just yeah. probably haven't gotten the experience at 9 and 10 because Connor and Johnny have been so good. I, I think there's something in that as well, though, um, Paul, I just think, you know, uh, like I, I'd like to see, and I've been, you know, on, on the record as saying I'd love to see more guys getting exposed at this point. I still feel like the World Cup is the real, that's the carrot, you know what I mean? And I'd be really focusing on that. 
I'd be really susceptible to making like wholesale changes. I always think that's really difficult. I always thought what Joe was brilliant at in, in, in my time in Leinster and in our Irish camp as well. I think he brings in a few guys into a strong nucleus. And I think there's an opportunity. Like the South Africa example. Yeah, well. but I think that's a brilliant yeah. way of doing it because I feel like you get some continuity amongst the team. People are, you know, there's more, I suppose, experience around them, people who are calm in the, in the, in the face of the fire. And that's really important for guys playing nine and ten. I'd love to see him maybe dot a few guys in and out of more of the games rather than say this Italian match that everyone's talking about saying let's put 15 new guys out in the pitch. I don't yeah. think that's necessary. I think he will do that and I see value in it um, because then, and you could go off the Italian match that just went by. I'm not sure they're, it's, it's as big a test as it probably should be. They're a little bit behind but I just think I'd be I'd be conscious of doing that. I think that's a re- this this competition is a really good opportunity to mix two or three guys in in each game. Do you think I'm on yeah, maybe, there? Maybe you're right. I'd say maybe injuries have stopped them from doing that recently. I suppose with um, I, can't, I can't remember everyone, but then but and Levy happen. obviously, yeah. Ty Byrne, mm. um, Henderson, uh, Rob Carney. Um, who else? We've another injury in the second or in the second. Devin Towner is out, Devin Devin is out now. Gary yeah. Ringrose. So, you know, you'd imagine Ty Byrne would have featured a little bit, and you'd imagine, you know, in the England game where we probably didn't have a whole pre- lot of pressure on the ball in the rook, a guy like Ty Byrne would have mm. been, would have been good, would have been important, and maybe had he been injury free, might have come more into their into the front of their minds for the Scotland game. Hmm. Um, so yeah, you probably you probably have a point. You probably have a point, and you you. It's something we used to actually say in Munster to some of the coaches. You know, very often when we made changes, it was wholesale changes, and some of the players really really struggled. And we always found that when a player went in with the with a strong team, you know, a young player or an inexperienced player went in with a strong team, they generally acquitted themselves really really well. Um, so probably you you have a point to be well worth doing. Yeah. And Paul, just before we let you go, I know you're going to talk a bit about your Aldi Play Rugby initiative. Yeah, well, that's why I'm home today. We we um, I got involved in Aldi in two, September 2016. Uh, the RFU already had a program, Play Rugby, where they had about 68,000 uh, kids playing rugby, non-contact rugby in primary schools. And Aldi have gotten involved since, and uh, we've grown the numbers to 100,000. And it's a, it's a free initiative. Um, where we send in community officers from the IRFU to coach. Uh, we give balls, cones, bibs, um, and it's been a real success. We've, of those 100,000 kids, about 44,000 of them are girls, which is pretty amazing. Um, and we've just launched a, a competition now where schools can win uh, 50,000 uh, euros for sports facilities in their school. And um, in one of the ads, actually, I was back in my own... My old, um, primary school on Moscow in Limerick and uh, the teacher's car park had been turned into an all-weather playing pitch was uh, which was incredible it wasn't there when I was there but it's an opportunity for schools to um, to invest in playing facilities for, for their kids and uh, it's basically a, a sticker promotion it's a, a big billboard that goes up in the school and kids collect stickers in their Aldi stores and then fill them up and once they get back into Aldi um, they're in a, in a competition to win two grants of, of around 50,000 for, for their schools so it's a great program and uh, I've really enjoyed being involved in it. Well, great stuff, Paul. Thanks so much for coming in. It's a pity we're going to have to let go all this extra staff that we brought in, <laughs> just especially for you. But besides that, it's been a very positive day. Really appreciate you coming in. No worries. My pleasure. My Cheers, pleasure. Paulie. Thank you.